All right, good morning. I'm Dr. Victor Politi. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for tuning in to Health Talk this morning. I'm President and CEO of New Health, the Nassau University Medical Center over on Hempstead Turnpike in East Meadow. And as healthcare in America is changing, New Health is part of that change. So this half-hour program will provide you with some essential information about our services and facilities that provide top-quality care that fits into your lifestyle. As you know, New Health, Nassau University Medical Center, our roots go deep into Long Island's history. What began in 1935 as a 200-bed general hospital has now become part of a unique health organization with multiple centers of care and a commitment to deliver excellent essential care to everyone at every stage of life. So you know Nassau University Medical Center on Hempstead Turnpike, that big building over there is a premier level one trauma center, but we have so much more to offer our community, including a full service, state-of-the-art, New Health Center of Care in Nassau University Medical Center. We have the A. Holly Patterson Nursing Home or Extended Care Facility in Uniondale. And we have a series of family health centers throughout Nassau County, serving some of our most needy population. So our improvements are making us a leading provider of primary and tertiary care services that rival the best in the country. So here we are today at our uh, bi-weekly talk uh, every, other two, every other Saturday, um, and uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Sperber. Dr. Sperber is our uh, director of our opiate or our addiction medicine services, should I say, at Nassau University Medical Center. And as we know today in, in Nassau County, as well as all throughout New York State and in many places in the country, uh, we're seeing an epidemic of drug use worse than ever, particularly using opiates and different types of uh, opiate-related products, pain medications, um, and basically it's taking a real toll on our, our youth of America and really causing a major problems uh, in families. Um, I know at Nassau University Medical Center, we had 51 uh, deaths uh, from overdoses in Long Island uh, that occurred over the, uh, over the last year alone. 51 deaths from heroin. There were about 120 deaths from opioid uh, medications in total, but this is horrible, horrible numbers of endemic proportions. And uh, we see the horror that you know, not only affects those families, but their friends and extended communities as well. So this is something that really touches the lives of everyone. Uh, you may not think so. Uh, you have children in high school, children in college. Uh, believe it, they're being exposed to this. They know what's out there. They hear the kids talking, and they probably know someone that's uh, used some of these medications at parties or in other places. So don't think it's not affecting your neighbor or not affecting yourself. Um, it's out there, just uh, as well as... Other things like alcoholism, uh, it's really a, a horrible life to be addicted to any type of these, uh, these types of uh, chemicals. So Dr. Sperber dedicates his entire life to treating these patients, to treating patients uh, in their, in their, at the most needing time, uh, when they're really at the, the lowest, where they're actually, uh, their lives, their every waking moment is consumed with trying to obtain uh, the euphoria associated with these drugs, and it's a very tough uh, feel the medicine to be in because you really are dealing not only with the uh, physiological effects but the psychological effects of the drugs as well and it's really deep rooted as to why these uh, patients are taking these drugs and how do we get them off it so um, Dr. Sperber welcome uh, I, I've talked Thanks enough. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Well, yeah why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself your training um, and your background. Sure uh, uh, so I'm a psychiatrist, and uh, I, I had my psychiatry residency training at Bronx Municipal Hospital at the Einstein Medical School. Before that, I went to Columbia Medical School. And before that, a long time ago, I uh, did my undergraduate work at uh, UC Berkeley back in the 60s. Um, so so uh, I'm uh, very glad that I've been lucky enough to have good training. and. Um, um, I also uh, worked at NYU with Mark Gallanter, who ran the addiction uh, division there for many years, and, and I set up the crack clinic there under a state, New York State grant. So, so I've been doing addiction treatment for a long time and uh, really uh, feel very pleased to be at Nassau University Medical Center where we have a, a large variety of addiction treatment resources, and which we'll talk about today, including uh, expanding our use of medications in addiction treatment. Uh, so, um, so UC Berkeley back in the '60s. Right, so you, exactly. you've seen the the drug uh, counterculture. I was there uh, when it started up. Yeah. Are you shocked to see the resurgence of heroin? I mean, it was big back in the '60s, and then in, in the '70s it sort of was replaced by cocaine and crack and marijuana, and and now to see it coming back, uh, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Well, well, you mentioned uh, the role of very strong. 
uh, opiate addiction pain pills. Um, and the, ex the, the marketing of a wide variety of long-acting and short-acting addiction pain pills has uh, made opiates available in settings where they didn't used to be available. You used to had to get heroin, you used to have to go into a pretty scary street environment, uh, take risk, risk getting arrested. But, but uh, these, these legal pharmaceutical pills then spread into the recreational world. So, so I think it's the availability of easier to access opiates plus, plus a huge change in our culture, um, which we don't have time to talk about today. But yeah. So people um, who are having some chronic pain, their knee, their back, or giving prescriptions legally for Oxycontin, Vicodin, Percocets. Exactly. Uh, so they're getting legal prescriptions. Um, they're not using it all. They're leaving it in their med medicine ch chest. Grandma or your Uncle, Uncle Joe's got some in his medical chest. Kids go there. They find it. They'll take half a prescription. They won't take the whole bottle. Or they'll take a bunch of the pills, and they'll start using it with their friends. And, and now they're going to become addicted. So you could become addicted to opiates from these pills? Exactly. These are very strong, pure opiates. And then what happens, uh, that the street price of the pills to, to get an Oxycontin pill, a long-acting opiate pill, is more expensive than heroin. So once a, 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 a teenager or young adult gets addicted to the pills, then they run out of money, and their friends say, well, do heroin, and then they start by snorting the heroin. But that's a waste of money, too, because it's a, it's a, it's a poor route for absorbing it. So they turn to shooting to get more, more bang for the buck. And that's the pathway. That's the main kind of admission we're seeing on our uh, rehab and, and detox units. O over half of them have gone from that opiate pill to heroin route. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, back in the 60s yeah. or in the yeah. 70s, when, when you know there was this whole stigma, you had to go to a shooting gallery in a vac vacant building somewhere and right. use dirty needles in a spoon. I mean, that, that sig stigma is now gone because you can get these these pills and, and you, you, yeah. you call your dealer on your cell phone. He comes in his BMW and delivers to your he, house. He delivers the heroin to right. you. And I mean, and the purity of the drugs. I understand today the heroin is much uh, stronger, much more, uh, uh, you know, stronger than it was back in the day. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the supply line from Colombia and Mexico and Middle East, but but it seems like the supply lines are highly developed and. Um, uh, uh, big business. Because, yeah, you know? like you mentioned, they, they don't have to shoot up with needles. They could snort it, right. uh, they could smoke it. Uh, there's other ways now you can, you know, because the purity has improved so much that they're able to get high without using the needles, without getting those track marks. Uh, you know, I remember growing up, I, you know, one of the things I would never use heroin because I don't like needles. I don't want to inject myself. That whole idea of the, you know, the junkie with the needle right. and the rubber band around his arm, that picture that we were seeing. But once you cross that bridge, it, you know, you, you get used to it very quickly and uh, becomes very rewarding to use the needle because it brings you big pleasure. So, so that uh, of, the, of the patients, you know, we have 50, at, at NASA University Medical Center, we have 50 D addiction beds, 20 for detox, five-day detox, and 30 for 28-day rehab. And, and I would say uh, of, of the opiate patients who come in for rehab, 90% are using needles. Needles, yeah. yeah because it, you, 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 you feel, you know, you absorb, this way you absorb 20% of what you bought, this way you absorb 100%. And yeah. the high that they get from that is so so much greater from injecting them sure. than the pills and the snorting Absolutely. that once they shoot you know, the heroin, that they're, they're, that's it. They're not, they're not going back to anything. They, they want to inject that drug. Well, some people go back and forth depending on the supply, but the preferred drug then becomes injected heroin. Injected Absolutely. Heroin. So we've, uh, some, some of the deaths that we've seen at the hospital have been some, a combination of, of opiate um, heroin and some fentanyl. Uh, which I understand is a very, very strong uh, uh, cousin to heroin. Um, right. And uh, these these kids don't know they're getting a mixture of heroin and fentanyl, and they shoot it like they would regularly, uh, and they overdose, and they and they die. Um, yeah, f fentanyl is an amazingly powerful opiate. It's a, you know, it's on, it's the anesthesiologists give it during surgery for pain. It's a an anesthesia drug. It was meant to stay there, but it didn't. In fact, in my career, I've, I've treated a couple of docs, a couple of anesthesiologists who had become addicted to fentanyl. It's an, I, I, you know, I don't know how the subject of pleasure experience, whether it's different from, from other opiates or just so powerful, so strong. Um, but, but it's, um, 
and, and, and the stronger the opiate, the more the risk of overdose yeah, also. So, so you put the stronger opiate in the heroin, as you were right, saying, right. that they, they don't know how strong what they're shooting is and they have more overdoses. Yeah. Right? And, and then the treatment for it, which is that um, antagonist uh, um, Narcan, naloxone, right. um, you know, most of the EMS responders and first responders are used, used to using a certain dosage, but with the fentanyl, which because it's so strong, they have to use a lot more of it uh, to try to reverse that, uh, the effects of the heroin. Right. Um, uh, I know that you were very instrumental in getting the uh, uh, naloxone put on the ambulances with the EMTs and not just uh, mm -hmm. so, the, so that the patients get overdose patients could get it quicker than having to be shipped to the ER. Right, right. Yeah. We did that. We gave it to, uh, as a matter of fact, with uh, Ed Mangano, the county executive. Right. It was his initiative to right. get the uh, Narcan on the police department. So every Nassau County police officer huh. uh, who really aren't even medically trained, but they have this Narcan that uh, formulates into an atomized solution, and they're able to spray it into the nose. You don't even have to eject it, so the police officers right. get there, and they just spray it um, into the nose of the it's overdose. It's very life-saving. Yeah. So Commissioner Crumpta, Police Commissioner Crumpta, uh, and together with Mr. Mangano and Linda Mangano, have really spearheaded this movement um, in, the, in Nassau County. Um, besides the police, the fire departments now all have it, the fire chiefs, as well as the EMS, but the basic EMT, not the higher level uh, paramedics. Right. So we're really getting that out there. So if we get on the scene uh, and they're able to use this um, and, you know, get the kid breathing again, well, at least we have an al a live body we could work oh, with. Sure. And, and, you know, and then we give them to you and hopefully, you know, through your detoxification and your rehabilitation, you're able to, to make some headway in that. Um, but it's such a difficult disease and such a difficult uh, such a do so, so you know why do people become addicts? Why don't, why don't you tell me that? So in the last twenty years, with the explosion of brain science, uh, we actually have learned pretty much how addiction works, and uh, we really didn't know before that. We had a lot of wrong-minded theories over the last fifty years, but but addiction turns out to be a brain disease caused by exposure to intoxicating chemicals. About one out of six people in the population has a genetic and inherited vulnerability to having their brains changed uh, by, by intoxicating drugs. And, and the changes are, there are two changes that occur in the brain. One is that the uh, pleasure impulse centers of the brain in, the, in this group of people with this genetic vulnerability, the, the, it, the, the impulses to, to seek this pleasure become wildly exaggerated. The, the impulses become stronger and stronger and stronger. Most of us, you know, if I see a piece of chocolate cake, I have an impulse. It comes from a certain part of my brain to eat the chocolate cake. And then, the, then another part of my brain is checked with and says, no, I'm on a diet or I've already had two pieces, I shouldn't have a third, and I inhibit the impulse. The second thing that goes wrong in the brain of this, uh, this one out of six people who become addicts after, if they use it, uh, intoxicating drugs is that the brakes, the part of the brain that stops and thinks, is this a good idea or not, gets disconnected from the impulse center during the impulse. So we all have impulses. We all have lots of impulses, but most of us inhibit the ones that aren't wise for us to act on. That wisdom, the frontal cortex, the learning part of the brain in, in people with addiction gets disconnected during the impulse. And, and about half the addicts, I've, I've interviewed a lot of addicts about whether they experience this, they say, yeah, when I'm in the impulse, I forget all the resolutions I made uh, in that moment. The others say, well, I remember it, but I don't have a feeling of caring about it. So either the caring gets disconnected or the actual memory of what your life plan is to get sober. And, and those, those are addicts. It's one, one, you know, 90 percent of high school kids use alcohol and pot, and one out of six of them becomes an addict. Right. So, because of this risk. So the alcohol and the, and the marijuana, you know, once you get into that subculture, now you're on the on the dark side. Exactly. Now you have the you're dealing with the, you know backdoor purchasing of marijuana and going the parking lots and meeting dealers, that sets you up almost like a gateway drug. Plus, um, you're having all these impulses. Now. And, yeah, yeah, and now you're having these impulses, and you're losing control of any type of uh, restraint that you might have. And someone offers you something else, um, and even though you know better because you're one of those one in six. Uh, is there any test to determine it genetically who's more at risk than this not, than others? Not yet, not yet. Yeah, so we really don't know the genes yet, so it's, but we'll get there. Yeah, I mean, because, no. you know, the children today are out there, and, you know, listen, drugs are there, and they have, to, they have to put up that wall. But if you have a family history, mm -hmm. uh, so, so the strongest genetic data so far is father-son uh, alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism is very heritable, father-to-son, 
mother-daughter, then father-daughter is the third most. So you, if, if you've got a family history, you should know that you're at risk. At risk. Yeah. And that's even more reason to keep your kids away from these things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So because of this model of yeah. addiction being mm -hmm. this acquired impulse disorder with disconnected uh, breaks, um, w w it, 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 it helps us understand how to do treatment. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe I would talk a little bit about treatment. Sure, absolutely. And I know we want to talk about the role of medication in treatment sure. today because the county us. has an initiative. Yeah, I mean, tell us about NASA University Medical Center, what we have available to people here in the community and how we can help them. Right. So, so just a couple words about treatment in general first, and then we'll t I'll talk about the hospital. Um, so because you have this impulse disorder where you're disconnected from your own good intentions, uh, if you're an addict, the, the, tr the central thing in treatment and why AA for the last 90 years has, or 80 years has worked so well is to Im embed yourself in an educated social network of recovering addicts so that when you're in the impulse, uh, some, somebody else, you can tell somebody else and they'll help you not act on it. Right. And so you do that in two places, in self-help programs like uh, NA and AA and in professionalized treatment programs uh, uh, where you have group and counseling. So, so treatment is based on teaching addicts that they have this disorder and how it works, what works so they can reinforce their efforts not to act on the impulses. And, and the first stage of treatment is to get off the drug. And, and we have, to, so at NASA University Medical Center, we have a 20 bed detox unit. Um, it just takes five days to safely get off the drug. So, th so you physically aren't in, with, in big withdrawal anymore after five days. And then we have a 28 day rehab. Um, where, where, where you are in a protected environment, so you get another t t 28 days clean, even if you're having impulses, you can't act on them because you've signed yourself into rehab. And then you get an intensive psychoeducation uh, about the brain disorder so that you accept a high degree of monitoring and involvement in sobriety networks when you leave. The key thing is after the 28 days, do you get into an intensive enough outpatient program? Right now, we're using community partner programs. We don't have our own at NUMIC, but we're, we're, we're uh, soon going to be setting one up to also have our own outpatient treatment program. Um, in, in the first year of treatment, the main job is to stay embedded in that support network, go to a meeting every day, uh, AA meeting, go to a clinic two or three times a week, um, so that when you're going through this period of impulsivity, you get the help you need not to act on it. Um, the good news, it's all been bad news so far, right? The good, well, the, good. So the, it's a life ring. You're throwing out a life ring. Right. The good news is that the more times you say no to an impulse and don't act on it, they gradually, slowly get milder. So, so not acting on impulses is part of the treatment because the impulses get gradually less often and less intense. And that takes roughly a year. And then the second year of treatment... Um, uh, is about putting your life back together mm -hmm. and while well, maintaining your abstinence. That's right. yeah. it's, it is amazing how it takes over your life. And I know, you know, really the key is to get someone into treatment, to get them to realize they have a problem, just you know, whether it's alcohol or cigarettes or heroin, you have to realize yeah. you have a problem and it needs to stop. And, and, and it's not your fault. Yeah. It's your brain has changed. And you, like any illness, you know, if you've got a bad knee, you have to walk us, you have to use a cane. Mm -hmm. you, you have to accept the illness and accept what it takes mm -hmm. to not succumb to it. And people compare it to even something like diabetes or hypertension. Right. It's a chronic medical medical condition that you need to put yourself on medication to, you know, to putting, bring it under control. And so we bring these patients in, and a lot of times they come in either because they're overdosed or the police bring them in because they've been locked up mm -hmm. uh, and they may have to go to jail uh, for possession or sale of these drugs. And now you get uh, patients, and for five days you say you detoxify them. So you gradually wean them off the type of drug they're on. So, so alcohol and uh, benzodiazepine sedatives like Valium ha work at the same receptors so you can, we don't give alcohol in a detox unit, so we use sedative pills and we, we step them down dose-wise over uh, three, four, five days so that the uh, withdrawal isn't too medically severe. With opiates, we use a little bit of methadone to step them down mm -hmm. uh, to zero over four or five days. So, so that, that spares them the, the suffering of severe and risk of severe withdrawal. But it does. But it, but it's just the beginning of treatment. So some of these patients receive. They, they take a lot of drugs. I mean, I heard people right. taking 20, 30 bags of heroin a day. Uh, I mean, these are huge amounts. Or, or six milligrams of Xanax. I mean, people take you know point 
two five milligram, a quarter of a, of a milligram, and you know they're they're asleep. Six milligrams is a huge dose, and yet they're able to function to some extent during their. In their so you're able to take them off that high degree of medication in five days. Well. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. I, I guess if we did it over a month, uh, yeah. they, they would feel very little suffering. Right. But we just do it to keep it medically safe. Um, there was an old Jill, Jill Clayberg movie, I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can, which depicts uh, uh, Valium withdrawal, mm -hmm. and, and uh, in which he's quite delirious. Uh, alcohol withdrawal um, uh, associated with GI bleeding has, has a 20% has a mortality rate. Mm -hmm. These are serious illnesses. So we, 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 our detox is just slow enough to, to get them off it safely, mm -hmm. but they still have huge psychological issues at the end of the detox, which requires rehabilitation. So treatment. after the five days, right. they're, they're drug free. There's no right. drugs in their system. Right. Um, they're, they're clean. Um, and now you send them into this really intense 28 day uh, rehab. I right. mean, do you have something like every single hour from wake to sleep that just keeps them occupied? Well, it's, you know, it's not every hour, but we have four or five. Uh, they have individual counseling. They have group counseling. They have a lot of group education classes. We bring in AA uh, people to run AA and NA meetings on the unit, um, so 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 they learn how to be sober. The, the 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 activities they have on the unit is the same they would have in an outpatient program, but being in a in a unit where where they where there is no access to drugs, it supports their intention to stay clean by by cutting off access. That's the key thing about inpatient treatment. Right. So, and they and they get some support. They're, they're in there with other addicts, right. other alcoholics, and they're seeing right. each other. They they share their problems. They understand they're not alone. I mean, because a lot of times people in in crisis feel they're alone. There's no one here to help me. But here gives they gives them some support. Absolutely, because because it's such a stigmatized disorder that that the patients. Um, you know, if you're being shamed and feel criticized and like you're a social outcast, it increases your the feel, need you feel feel to get high. Mm -hmm. So, so we try to create an environment where we see it medically rather than as a social failure of some kind. So now you graduate the program. It's 28 right. days. You're being discharged uh, from and National right. University Medical Center. Right. And you mentioned that some of them, it, it, it's not over. That it's very very important for you to have some more intensive supervision, some, you know, daily, uh, you know, right. uh, contact with the psychiatrist or and with anybody the Anybody can stay clean in a hospital. Mm -hmm. To stay clean when you leave the hospital is much harder. Right. So I know we wanted to talk about the role of medications in yes. treatment. Yes, sure. So, so let's get to that. So, so, so th this is a disorder uh, th that had a very high relapse rate. And uh, we're looking for ways to augment treatment so that the relapse rate is, uh, is less, so that people have a better chance. And there are a variety of medications that are used in different ways. Today I wanted to focus on the use of antagonist mm -hmm. medications, mm -hmm. medications which um, block the receptor, in the case of opiates, the opiate receptor, uh, which where, where the heroin or, or Percocet, uh, Perc uh, oxycodone uh, molecule binds in the nervous system to make you feel high. So, so we have drugs which can block those receptors. You already covered the short-acting antagonist, uh, Narcan, which uh, allows people who've overdosed to wake up by, by knocking the opiate off the receptor. But we also have a long-acting blocker called uh, naltrexone, uh, brand, brand name Revia or Vivitrol injection, which, which patients, uh, we offer to patients now, uh, if, they're, if they don't have liver disease and if they've been off their opiate for 10 days, they can usually safely go on uh, naltrexone. And uh, in our, we offer it in our rehab uh, unit um, where they've got their 10 days clean. We've checked to make sure that they don't have liver disease. And, and then we start them on this uh, naltrexone pills. Um, and, and then they, it's a, really a psychological device because they now say, well, I, uh, there's no point. I have an Im I'm having an impulse to get high. There's no point in my getting heroin because I'm blocked. I have the antagonist on board. It's a waste of money. And, and it turns out that that's a very effective psychological device for patients who are highly motivated to stay clean. So if, I, if, I've, if I'm sick and tired of being an addict, I'm ready to get clean, I sign into detox, I sign into rehab, but I know that I'm going to have dozens and dozens of impulses every day. If I, have this, if I have this naltrexone on board, or if I have a Vivitrol injection of, of naltrexone, which lasts a month, that then I then then my brakes that part of my brain that says don't use it has an added argument which is there's no point using it because mm -hmm. I'm not going to get high, mm -hmm. 
it's, this drug is not for everybody. It's only for highly motivated patients who are already in, in the psychosocial treatment, the group and treatment program, who, who want to have their impulsivity decreased. Um, with naltrexone, we know that for, even though it's an opiate blocker, interestingly, it decreases the amount of impulses and severity for alcoholics, and to some degree does that for opiate addicts, too. It's not the main way it works. The main way it works is knowing that you have it on board, so there's no point getting high. And we're adding that to our toolkit to help addicts. And, and uh, if you come onto our uh, rehab unit uh, and it's medically safe for you to take it, we'll offer it to you. And this is part of a county program. The county has started a big, I think it's called uh, a, a new shot at life or something mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so that addicts who are frustrated with their frequent relapsing uh, have an added tool to uh, be successful in their efforts to stay sober. So Vivitrol, although it's great, naltrexone depot right. injection, and it helps, it's not a miracle drug. It's not going to immediately end addiction issues here in Nassau County. It's just another uh, tool, another medication that you have in your in your in your medicine box exactly. uh, to help to help these motivated uh, you know patients. Right, um, but but it's important because it's it's for the patients who are already trying hard. Right, right. And and you the ones you really want to help the most because they're trying so hard, but they're just so impulsive. And it gives them and it gives the 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 breaking the impulse inhibiting part of the brain an added argument mm -hmm. not to use. Mm -hmm. And and in the studies, it, it increases outcome. Mm -hmm. In people who are in the treatment who are also taking a a medicine to augment their treatment, those patients do about a third better than the patients who are in treatment but don't have the medicine. So it, it it's me has measurable benefit for the right patients. So uh, you mentioned mentioned a little bit about the neurophysiology, how this stuff works, right. the Narcan uh, right. dislodging the opiate from the receptor so that it doesn't work. Right. Um, it's interesting to note that, that, that people, when they overdose, right. uh, that it also depresses their breathing. And so the main problem that we have in emergency situations is they use the heroin, maybe the heroin mixed with the fentanyl that they mm. don't know about or too much or too little. and then they overdose. And what we mean by overdosing isn't just that you're nodding out and not falling over and your nose is dripping and, you know, all the, the classic stereotypical, uh, you know, effects, but your breathing stops. And right, the really, respiratory drive is, is shut off. Right, and so that when you see a person who is overdosing, right. they, they need to breathe. Um, and that's where the Narcan helps. It, it right. helps the breathing. Uh, and a lot of times when we talk to kids who, who've been at parties or know someone who's overdosing, they're afraid. They're afraid to call the police. They don't want to call their parents. They don't want to call an ambulance. But yet they had to realize that, that that child could die and that if they are at a party or they're at someone's house or they know someone who's using uh, opiates or heroin and they see a person overdosing, they need to call the police. They need to call the ambulances to get that kid some Narcan and get him to the hospital because right. that's the horror. Um, you know, there was someone, you know, they were at a party and, and someone overdosed and people are afraid because they don't want to ruin the party or call the police, but someone could die from that. And that's a real strong message for parents to give their children. Uh, that if they're at one of these things, that they need to notify an ambulance to get and, someone And do there. CPR until the ambulance gets there. Absolutely, right. absolutely, because that, that child can live uh, from an overdose if someone acts right. quickly and appropriately for them. And so this naltrexone is a long-acting medication, but we haven't talked about methadone. Now, methadone, I remember for many, many years, was, you know, it was the treatment for opiate, but it always had a stigma attached, and people were always concerned about methadone clinics in their community or people that use methadone and problems that come along with that. We have methadone clinic at NASA University Medical Center? We do. It's, it's, uh, it's not a NASA University Medical Center program, but it's on, we, it's on our uh, location uh, in K building and Campus, mm -hmm. uh, it's a county program and um, I, I, I've had a lot of experience working with in methadone programs I, I worked in the Bellevue methadone program and at the Bronx uh, municipal at Bronx State and meth you know uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine which I, I know you're in and um, is is uh, makes the point the right the right patient the right treatment for the right patient that that a there are a variety of different kinds of addicts who need different treatments and methadone is not for everybody but for patients who are just not able to to stay clean but don't want to have the chaos of using illegal drugs it this is a maintenance treatment where they can be maintained on methadone and now also with suboxone. Um, so, so that at least they, they're not in the illegal drug world, and they're on a fixed dose so they no longer get intoxicated and, and they can function. Right. Um, so so I, tell us how we can get help. Give us some. We're winding down. So. Right. Okay. So, so um, 
the, uh, we have uh, three addiction services at Numic. If you want to be screened for the uh, detox unit, uh, that's the second number, 5726740. 5726740. Is the screening phone number for our uh, detox, both alcohol and opiate and other drugs. If you want to be screened for the rehab unit, the 28 day rehab and don't need detox, that's in area 516 572 9402. 572 9402. And if you want to call the county clinic either to find out about, about uh, Vivitrol injection and the county program or methadone maintenance treatment, that's 572-5801. So, so um, a lot of options available. Dr. Sperber, what an interesting half hour I had. I mean, it really is your, your wealth of information. Your background is amazing. Mm -hmm. To be in the addiction medicine field is you're someone who lived it and worked through it for many, many years. And we're very proud at NASA University Medical Center to have you and, you and many other physicians like yourself and counselors in our program. So I, I just would like to say thank you. Um, right. I would just like to, to thank all the listeners this morning. Um, I hope you learned some something from us, and, uh, you know, it, it's always good to get the word out. So I'm Dr. Victor Politi. I'm the president and CEO of the National University Medical Center on Hempstead Turnpike. Um, we're here for you together through life, and I thank you for listening. Have a good day. Thank you.